Hello, everyone. That's so many people. I'm actually surprised so many people are interested in this boarding topic. Um, so let's see. Um, my name is Vlad. I'm on the CSL team at Twitter, which is um, the team that owns Finagle and Twitter Futures. And this is my completely unbiased comparison of the um, Scala Futures and the Twitter Futures. And, um, but I have to warn you, it's not, it's not really a competition. It's not like a battle. There's no winners or losers. Um, and I'm not going to tell you that you should go ahead and use Twitter Futures for your next project. Uh, well, you should totally do that, but not because I told you you should run your own tests. And instead, I'll try to give you some um, insights into why Twitter futures exist, how are they different from Scala futures, and um, how those differences can serve a great good for networking libraries like Finagle itself. And um, before we start, a little, closer. a little closer, OK, something like this, better? Um, so, and before we start um, talking about the differences between those two, two, two future implementations, um, let's um, look at the historic context of why Twitter futures exist in the first place, why they happened to be in the um, Scala ecosystem. And um, which seems to be a really confusing topic uh, based on the internet discussions. Um, so, let's scroll back for a second, year 2010. Um, what tools exactly did we have for um, doing asynchrony on the JVM? And the answer is we didn't really have that much. There was um, Java Concurrent Future, which isn't actually a future, but somewhat awaitable. Um, so you ha in order to interact with its value, you have to actually block on it and wait for, for the value to be available, uh, which is not really a good grade for asynchrony. Um, there is um, Scala Actors Future, which is not even ACA Future, it's Scala Actors Future. It's the one that was built in into the standard library. And it had the map, flat map things and callbacks, so it's more or less a future, but um, it was highly coupled to, the, to their Actors um, library, so there's no way we could have used that. Um, really dark times, summer 2010, probably too early to um, talk about asynchrony and this kind of thing. Scala was a 2.8 at that point, with like zero people using it in production. And um, it was two and a half years before C14 happened, which is known as um, Scala Futures and Promises, and Scala 2.10. And even more, four years before actual Java future happened, which is completable future. Um, so we made an executive decision to um, roll our own thing, which is known as Twitter Future. And um, thanks to the GitHub history, we can look into that. Um, and it's that simple. It's less than 100 lines of code. Um, and it's not stack safe. It doesn't have all the fancy features. But it was like a good start. You know, It was something we couldn't um, uh, take and iterate on. It was a, um, it was a great deal, actually. So, um, all right, so what happens next? Two and a half years later, we've got um, Scala Futures in place. We've got Scala 2.10. Scala Futures and Scala Promises. And yet, as you know, Finagle and the rest of the Twitter ecosystem is still using um, its own futures, its own future implementation. And there are actually reasons to that, multiple reasons, I should say technical reasons, because this is a technical conference. We're not talking about business reasons of switching from one future implementation to another, because there are none. Um, there's no way you can tell 2,000 engineers stop doing what they're doing and rewrite their services using new asynchrony primitive. It's not going to happen yet. So we're just talking about technical reasons. So those two um, future implementation at that time, we are already so different in, in terms of compatibilities and options you may have. And they remain different until this very moment. And um, we'll see later how we actually utilize those differences in libraries like Finagle and the rest of the Twitter ecosystem. Um, so, and the first biggest difference is probably scaling. It's something that uh, most of the users interact the first when they start using Twitter Futures. And it's probably the most confusing part because, um, as you know, there is no execution context for Twitter Futures. There is nothing that implicitly coming into map and flat map functions. So there is no actually an easy way to tell on which thread pool to execute this given callback. Um, and the, more confu the most confusing part about that is um, Twitter Futures sort of prefer um, local execution. They favor uh, something called local scaling. So the way it works, when you satisfy a promise, it actually goes and runs all your callbacks from the same thread 
used to satisfy this promise. So it's kind of counterintuitive. There is no asynchronity. There is no parallelism. How is it even the future? Um, but in fact, if you um, think about that, if you think about the history of the Twitter future, um, if you think about finagle context to, towards which it's biased, um, um, there is uh, there's actually this thing is, uh, like a shared uh, thread pool within every finagle application, which actually used to um, run your promises within multiple threads and make sure to keep a good affinity between connections requests and your threads in the thread pool such that you satisfy and run your promises within multiple threads and do that in pretty much uniform manner. So you got a good concurrency and m m parallelism out of the box. So you don't have to do anything else. So this technique is called local scaling and um, you can take a look at the uh, scaler in the util library how it's implemented. It's really simple. It's just like, again, really less than 100 lines of code. Um, and it's just attach a local scaler to the current thread, like thread local scaler, and just runs your stuff. It's really simple. Um, and it's not only makes it really easy to run and um, utilize your resources better, because you don't have to sp spin up a new thread and new thread pool and stuff like that. It actually helps you to reduce context switches as well. And we've been experimenting in the past trying to re um, swap the scalar from something like local scalar into the fork join scalar, which is the fork join pool. And it didn't actually work great because, uh, because of the burden of switching threads and doing context switches. Um, so this thing works pretty, pretty well for us. Um, so the next is um, really exciting stuff, I think, is um, something called root compression and promise linking. And you can think about that as um, a tail call elimination for your um, future recursion. Um, let me just show you an example. Is it big enough? Um, like this. All right, let's see. Um, let's say we want to write a function that computes a factorial of a given number, and we want to structure that in a way that looks like a tail recursive function. So it takes um, an argument we wanted to accumulate the value on um, as f future fin in here, and it returns that um, as a result. So the first thing we do, we um, check the terminal condition and we return the value. Oh, sorry, this one already ag aggregated, so we can just return that. And if not, we just do the flat map here and we get the value out of it. And this is i. And we just call the same function again here. We have to decrement the counter and we have to accumulate the result. Uh, dot value and we multiply that. Something like this. And you know, um, we can just run it here with initial value and it works. It's not, it's not a surprise that it works, right? Um, so, so what exactly happens here? Let's talk about that. Um, this function fact actually produces a new promise on each iteration. And the pro you use that promise as an argument to the flat map function that is um, called within that the same function, sort of like future recursion. And if you, if you try to imagine how it looks like, it's sort of like um, a chain of promises linked from um, each other's flat map callback, sort of like a linked list thing. Uh, and what's so bad about this chain? What's so, um, what's so terrible about this? Um, and the problem is those chains could be really long, and the whole thing cannot be garbage collected until you actually resolve the whole structure. So you have to get to the bottom of the recursion. You have to meet the terminal condition and resolve the whole thing, and then you can collect that. Um, this is effectively um, a space leak because um, those chains might be really long, and you can allocate some stuff within your promises, uh, within your callbacks. Or um, even better, th those chains can be unbounded. You can have infinite recursion, and it actually works pretty well on Finagle. Um, so in how to solve this problem, there's actually a solution, really nice, uh, really nice one. Um, Similar to a um, tail call elimination for your functions, for your um, stacks, to, that helps you to unwiden your stack. Um, promise linking and, pr and root compression helps you to unwiden your promise chain. Um, essentially, instead of forming this long chain and linked list of promises, you're trying to link every single individual promise back to the root one directly, such that those um, temporary promises that you have within your recursion can be collected as long as you leave the scope basically as long as you're not referencing them from the user's code. And this is really efficient and um, really, really effective. And we use that a lot in Finagle. Here's, for example, the um, something called ping-based failure detector that has this method loop right here, which is essentially a tail recursive, uh, well, future recursive method. 
and it calls loops from themselves, and it's infinite, uh, infinite recursion. It doesn't, um, it doesn't blow up your heap, doesn't blow up your stack, it works just fine. And it's been running in production for years. Um, and so Scala 2.12 um, actually have support for that. They fixed that. There's this um, really good article, really good blog post called Async Continuation um, Passing Style. It actually explains how that stuff works. And um, it says from where, when they fixed that, actually, from, from which version of Scala, 2.12, M3, I think. Um, yeah, um, right. So the next really useful thing is interrupts, something that allows you to um, cancel your, your futures, basically, cancel the chain of your transformations. And you can think about that um, as, imagine you're designing an asynchronous API, you have some promise within your API, you return it back to the user as a, as, as a future, and the user can signal you back that they're no longer interested in the result, and you have to, I mean, you can use this information to your, to your own needs. You can, you can cancel your calculation or do something like that. This is really useful. Let me show you an example. Um, um, like, imagine we have this promise here, um, the one we want to return from the API to the user, and the user gets that and um, do some transformation with that again. Some, I don't know, async boundaries, right? We want to introduce some future chain um, to actually show that those interrupts are being propagated. Um, so user can do like flat map or something like this um, to anything. And so what's interesting here is that the new promise um, is in state transforming and it actually says from which promise it's transforming from. And um, so what happens next, we can set an interrupt handler uh, for our original promise within our API. And um, it takes a partial function from trouble, we're not really um, matching on it, we just say, you know, don't care. Just print the stack trace. Stack trace. Um, and the P is now in state interruptible. And if you query the original, the new promise again, it is actually transforming from the promise that is interruptible. So it's ready to be interrupted. And it actually captures the, um, you know, the interrupt handler right here as a function one. Um, so, and then user at some point decides that they're no longer interested in the result, they can just raise and interrupt on that. Um, they just do something like this, exception, just using some exception to signal it back. And we can see the stack tray is being printed. And if we query the state of the promise, it says interrupted. And it's actually capturing the exception that was used to interrupt it. And the new promise that user was dealing with this it actually has um, the same state. It's interrupted as well. So the whole thing, the whole um, chain of transformation is going to be interrupted. And the interruption is going to be propagated back to the um, very root promise, the original one. Um, and this thing enables lots of uh, finagle futures, like um, very simple one, finagle timeouts. Um, it's just, again, three lines of code. We say uh, we want to wait for a response a given timeout, and if it doesn't, um, doesn't resolve, we want to just interrupt this thing. And it's up to the finagle, the rest of the stack, what to do with that information. Um, and it's actually pretty useful, because if the request wasn't written to wire, you can just drop it on the floor. You don't have to you know, send it. You, you can save some traffic. Um, so last one is really interesting, locals. Um, it's like thread locals, but for your um, futures. So instead of following the JVM threads, they will follow your application flow or program flow, which usually, usually is asynchronous. Um, again, some example here. So let's see, we've got this new local. It's a type in the util library. And we can query that. It has nothing in it right now. So it's empty. And uh, so the way it works, you can reference that I variable from within your callbacks in your transformation chain. And you don't have to worry about what threads um, those callbacks are being to be executed, because you will always see the reliably see the same value that you set in the beginning of your transformation. Um, just let's, let's just model it uh, real quick. We have this function run um, that gives you a unit, um, for example. Um, let's see, we want to have two promises so we can have some um, async boundary to, to run them on two different threads. Um, and this one again. So and now we can actually produce some computation, do some transformation. Um, let's do flat map. We don't care about this. We just print the current value in the local itself. And then we do, again, produce an async boundary here and print the value. Uh, 
even the, the local value we reference from here. And then we want to round those two promises. And, and we want to do that from two different threads. So we have this actually machinery in place to, to introduce this async boundary and make sure the local is being propagated. So I have this function, which is, uh, which is called shift and run. It just spin up a new thread and satisfy your promise. There's, not, there's no uh, magic to it. Um, shift, shift and run. And this is the P, and then shift and run. I want to run them sort of in parallel, and this is Q. This is it. Nice. Uh, so if we run it, we've got two nouns because there is no local set to it. And the way we do that, we say let um, 10. And then we have the context, and we run our computation and get two tens back. Even though we executed those two different callbacks from two different threads, we still see the same value. Um, so, and it's actually a pretty useful thing to and we use it all over the places in Finagle. The most user-facing usage probably is something called user, user context. Um, it's, you can think about this this way. When request comes in, it gets a fresh context assigned and it will follow that request for the life cycle of the request. And you can shove some stuff that, you know, like trace ID request, ID deadlines, anything you want there. And you will always reliably would be able to query that from within any transformations tab in your application. And um, what's so, what actually really awesome about context is that they can actually be serialized and be propagated over the wire for you. Um, so imagine you can set the client ID on your client, and then send the request as your local, just your local thing, the same I show you here, and then send your request, and, the, um, and that value will be serialized for you, deserialized on the server, and you will get that as your local, and you can use it again, just the same way you use your locals, basically. It's a really powerful concept. Um, yeah, I think this is actually pretty much it. And again, to the best of my knowledge, there is no such thing in Scala um, futures. There is something called thread local variables in Scala futures from 2014. I think you can model that um, to some extent, but I'm not sure how workable is that solution. Um, so that's pretty much it. That's pretty much what I wanted to tell you. The last thing I want to just mention real quick is um, um, uh, I. I it's, it is unfortunate, I guess, and inconvenience that uh, Finagle and the rest of the Twitter stack is using its own future implementation. But I hope that I managed to give you some insight into how important it is to have this ergonomic built in into your core abstraction, core primitive, and how it helps you to express really complicated matters like timeout, retries, context, locals, and stuff like this in a really natural and easy to reason about way. And um, Twitter features helped us to do that with Finagle. They helped us to build Finagle in the first place, and they helped us to evolve it into a very unique technology it is today. Thank you very much. I think we have some time for questions if you have any. Yes? Um, I don't know the, the history here, but I'm curious if was, was there any involvement with the Twitter people at SIP 14? Um, I don't know the history here, but was there any involvement with the Twitter oh, yeah. folk and SIP 14 in the oh, yeah. creation of Scala features? And how come Scala didn't implement the features from Twitter features in general? Um, yeah, some people were involved. You can go into SIP 14 and find out who exactly it was. I think it was Myris. Um, but uh, yeah, that's a good question. I think those like locals, interrupts, and stuff like that didn't made it to the original proposal because they probably were too complicated to implement in the first place. Um, we had an exam we had a usage for them at that time, but Scala futures didn't exist. They didn't have a usage for them. They maybe didn't decide to uh, support that. Even root compression, something I show you, like infinite future recursion, wasn't actually a thing until 2.12. Um, any question over here? Hey Vlad, uh, great talk. I have a question regarding tracing the future. So one of the problems that I faced um, while debugging asynchronous applications is you don't realize which code path the future actually took. Uh, there was a blog post about something called tracing future, I'm pretty sure. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, that's a good question. Uh, so the idea is it is really hard to um, it's really hard to debug, right? Yeah. Uh, and we are aware of that. We've been trying to make it better and better. And the last thing we did was to support something called async stack traces for IntelliJ. Um, IntelliJ um, has this basically API to describe how to follow the asynchronous stack trace. And we did, we did add support for that to Twitter Futures. So if you use IntelliJ to debug your Twitter Futures application, you should be able to glue your async stack traces into sort of like a local stack trace. You can figure out what's going on there. 
um, it's, it's actually pretty helpful. Um, I think we, we have it enabled by default for Twitter developers. Is, uh, is, is, um, is there something that could be enabled on compile time that actually, uh, rather than a runtime agent or just like a drop in replacement, whereby, let's say, um, it might be expensive to use that, but if people want to use it for their critical code paths, then that penalty could be justified yeah. to get Right. I think there have been some experiments with that. I think some people actually tried to add um, sort of like compile time support for that. And it didn't work by the, by the overhead reasons because you can imagine how heavily Twitter futures and Twitter promises used within Twitter data centers. Um, and just if you add one little thing into every promise, you will probably um, see that on your charts. Anything else? Uh, that's it. Thanks so much. <laughs>